Welcome to an all-new Restoration Today podcast brought to you by Next Gear Solutions, now part of CoreLogic. Next Gear is the preferred technology provider for the restoration industry and serves managed repair networks, franchisors, contractors, and insurance carriers looking to run a consistently smarter business. Manage your jobs from anywhere and communicate with customers in real time. Visit nextgearsolutions.com to learn how Next Gear can help you transform your restoration business today. Hey there, thanks for checking out another episode of the Restoration Today podcast. Today, I'm very excited to be joined by Phil Rosebrook Jr. He is a pro at everything restoration. He's been in the industry for a while and really knows his stuff. And every year he puts together a really cool article um, that assesses his predictions from industry trends the year before. And then he kind of predicts what he foresees in the future, the coming year for the restoration industry as well. So these were the cover stories for CNR's January and February issue. And so now I want to have Phil on and kind of break down the articles and talk about what it all means and some of the other things that he's maybe seeing, some of the tips that he has for helping contractors work through some of these trends that are real pain points like inflation and job shortage and stuff like that. So Phil, thank you very much for joining me. So how long have you been in the industry now? Oh, well, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm so excited to be here. Um, I've been in the industry since 1988. So I believe that's probably about 34 years. Give a, a February will be 34 years. So no, February was. How about that? Long time. <laughs> there you go. Okay. And how long have you, have you been consulting that whole time? Like where are your roots? What's been your journey in restoration? So, so my father bought a restoration company back in 1988. I was just graduating from high school. So I didn't start when I was 12. I started in uh, kind of my beginning of my adult life and we spent 10 years as operators. And during those 10 years, I spent the uh, part of that working through college and I worked uh, pretty well full-time while I'm going to college. And then after that, um, I, you know, people said I worked half days. You just pick which 12 hours. So um, I, I lived the restorer life. And, uh, and, and during that time, I filled nearly every position in a restoration company. So at the end of that, uh, my father sold the business and he took off on what I call a restoration road trip. And he drove from Oregon to Detroit, Michigan and back. And he had this belief that restorers needed someone to talk to who'd been in their shoes. It's a strange business. It's hard. It's quirky. And so uh, what he found, it, he found out that he was, uh, he was right in that assessment. And so when he got back, he probably had four or five clients. And um, he, they, they'd always ask him questions of, um, you know, how do, great, I love the plan. How do I do it? And his response kind of was, well, I hired people. I'm a business guy. I'm not a restorer. Although he'd been in the restoration world. And so he'd be calling me at night. And uh, I'd moved to Colorado, was working with a company called Rocky Mount Catastrophe at the time, yep. helped them open a Fort Collins office. So um, I, he would call me at night and ask me questions about all of the things that they were saying, well, how do I do this? How do I do that? And so um, he um, was recruiting me hard and uh, made me an offer to become his business partner in 1997. Okay. And in 1997, I became a 27 year old business consultant. And uh, since then, I've traveled across North America, helping restorers create a vision and a plan for their company. And then we, you know, typically our plan is to help them. We, we come and take that plan off the shelf and walk them through the process of implementing that in their business and, and um, executing the, the plan. So how long have you been doing these scorecard and prediction articles? Um, so I started writing just kind of just so my, my regular newsletter updates. And uh, I, so I would... Uh, do a um, uh, kind of my thoughts on your 10 things you need to do at the beginning of the year. So it was yeah. always this January update. And then it sort of evolved into this thought of let's look at what's happening in the industry and try to project out forward what it looks like. Uh, so I started, if I, I look back a little bit, I think it was around 2014, 15, that I really started looking at a trends kind of perspective on it. Um, and how has been your, how is, how is, sorry, how have your grades been so far on your predictions yeah. as you review them the next year? So it's interesting. So the first thing is, is I grade myself. So, um, <laughs> you know, I'm probably an easy grader. I don't really know. But see, the thing I thought, I, I thought if I'm going to make predictions, uh, if I have any credibility, we had to look back and say, did I make any, um, did I say things that were wise the year before? Otherwise, I'm kind of irrelevant. You know, I, I could say a lot of things. Uh, so, there's two elements to what I do. The first one is, is I make a big prediction and then I talk about a response to it because I think that that's a fair thing to do. It's like, okay, so what does that mean to me and my company? So um, 
the one thing that I may not get the element of the prediction exactly right, but they're real relevant points that people should have been implying in their company based on kind of the, the, the let's say the nuances of that trend. Mm-hmm. And so I'll give you an example. Um, last, well, yeah, last year, my, my, my main prediction last year, um, the actual bold prediction, I was way off. And I was shocked. I almost fell out of my chair when I read it because my prediction was that insurance companies would have an underwriting loss. And that came from just my, my, I was looking at what was going on in the industry. If we have to go back and say, okay, in the insurance industry, and this was part in, in, so there's a lot, we'll unpack this in a minute. So, um, what, what was happening in the industry is we had major wildfires, uh, hurricanes. It was, it was setting up to be a big hurricane year. Uh, there was, uh, you know, uh, uh, just kind of other strong weather issues. You had the rioting. You had, I mean, insurance companies were fully engaged. <laughs> they were fully engaged. Uh, w- there was a couple. And, and then I was also looking and saying, gosh, you know what? We have all of these COVID claims out there. What's going to happen with those? And if the insurance companies have been on the hook for, all this BI loss of business interruption and all those policies and some employment policies, it would have been a really, really tough year from a claim standpoint for the insurance industry. The first thing that happened was a lot of, this is my assessment on the outside. So I'm not an insurance expert. I kind of read through a lot of insurance articles. Um, My my understanding or my belief is that a lot of the catastrophe stuff was covered by reinsurers, they probably got, got hit pretty hard, but the regular insurance companies, they're, they're underwriting loss. So premiums into claims out, that's an underwriting profit. If you think about that, I'm going to go in the insurance companies are investment companies. Yeah. And so I'm going to borrow your premium money. I'm going to invest it. I'm going to pay that premium back out to you at some point in the future. But in the meantime, you gave me free money to go invest. That's a brilliant model. So um, if I can make a profit on that too, so not only do I make money on the money you loan me, now I'm also making uh, money on my investment. So I'm doubling up on it. So uh, the, the underwriting loss, I thought, I thought there would be an underwriting loss. I just was looking and saying, there's a lot of claim stuff going on, a lot of potential claim stuff that, that will likely hit. So at the end of the year, I read an article and said the insurance industry had made an underwriting profit of about two or three percent, and that's a big number actually. Uh, it might have been more than that, and I was really surprised. So that was massively wrong. I would have given myself just on the prediction itself probably an F for that because it was wrong. But my recommendations were if that's going to happen, the insurance company is going to start looking at the other side of the equation and saying, okay, how do I manage my my, my payments and minimize those. So I got my premiums coming in and I got my costs going out as an insurance company. So they would be looking at how do I cut back all of my claims costs? How do I cut back my administrative costs? How do I cut back what I'm paying contractors to fulfill the insurance promise? Mm-hmm. So I was right on what steps were going to be happening in the industry from the insurance adjusting perspective and the claims perspective. They were continuing to drive for reduction of their payouts because, well, they're, they're in the profit business. So they're, and we're an expense. And so I made recommendations that people needed to take in their business to be aware of their costs and to protect their profits. So I was right on that. That's why I gave myself probably a reasonable grade for that. Um, and some of them, you know, some of them were kind of obvious, like uh, we got problems with labor, we got problems with, you know, so th- th- those things come through but they're acute and they're impact our, our, our industry. And so my, my, my assessment in the year before, there were some obvious I, items, but the, how they respond to them or how they manifest themselves in a company were always a little different. And so my, my, my grades typically are pretty good on the recommendations. And mm-hmm. most of the time, they're really good on what's impacting companies today because I'm traveling all over North America. I'm talking to restorers every single day and I'm seeing what's impacting and hitting and in, uh, what the challenges are in their companies. Yep. And so it's not just a company. I look at a broad array of companies and I get this feedback and I say, okay, gosh, this is really impacting those companies. So I think, you know, to, that's a really, really long answer to your very short question. My, my grades typically are pretty, pretty solid. I think I, I, I have a good pulse on, on the industry. And so uh, my, my assessments of how you should be managing your company are always really solid to what the, the pressures are um, yep. Occasionally, uh, Mark Springer called me uh, um, a couple of years ago when COVID hit and everybody's sitting at home and he says, Phil, I got your permission to uh, kind of make you look bad a little bit because your <laughs> prediction in, what was it, 2020? 
my main number one prediction was we we're going to have a labor problem. That was not the main problem in, in companies. And so was I way off on that? No. Yeah. yeah. So there you go. No one was predicting COVID. So even if, yeah, no one was predicting it. How common is it for, um, for multiple elements of your predictions from one year to carry to the next year? Like, like M&A and labor, for example, are continuing to carry from 2021 to 2022. How often do you see kind of the same things travel from one year to the next? Uh, so one year to the next, probably there, there is some consistency in that, especially when they're driven by macro issues. You know, labor, labor. So what changed two years ago, labor was a problem for my, particularly a management level. I'm on skilled restoration people. It's really hard. Yeah. This year. Yeah. Labor is a problem. It's not my managers. A lot of my clients are actually having a reasonable time finding good restoration managers, but frontline labor. Yeah. I can't find a technician for my life. And so it's really difficult. So that changed. So, the, so I think some of the nuances of a prediction might change. However, labor has been a problem for three years, four years. Um, it won't be a problem in probably eight or nine years. We have the opposite problem as everything becomes automated and we have artificial intelligence and we, we're starting to replace maybe some of the real mundane task things that we do because technology will streamline that. So mm-hmm. it, that'll change somewhere. But, but right now, um, I don't, I, I don't know. I necessarily see a, a, a challenge. The, the labor is still going to be a problem okay. next year. Maybe it'll loosen up because there's really rough waters in the economy right now from wars to inflation to everything else. And so, you know, I, I, I won't be able to make any thoughts on that until late in the year, but I think late in the year, we may see those things freeing up. So, so it may change uh, next year, but, but quite frequently, there's a couple big things that carry from year to year. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah. Um, but, but I can't, uh, you know, inflation, will inflation be a problem next year? Yeah, maybe at the end of the year, it'll still be a problem next year, maybe. Uh, but labor is going to be a problem for a couple of years. And so, yeah, uh, quite, quite frequently things carry over. Uh, but but it, trying to figure out how they impact a company or the industry in general is maybe a little different. Okay. Um, so what tips or advice do you give your clients or other restorers on the labor issue? I mean, I feel like there are a lot of people that are writing articles about here's some ideas to overcome. And it's a lot of honestly the same thing. I hate to say that out loud, but it is kind of true. Do you have any advice that you're giving them that's maybe a little different than what we're hearing? Um, so I, I don't know. So I don't know exactly everything you're hearing, uh, but, but I'll tell you my thoughts on labor. The first thing is uh, good people have always been hard to find. Yep. Uh, good people right now are working. And so you're not going to find them. If you place an ad, you're not going to get people coming to your door. You have to go find them where they're working. Um, you've got to be a student of, of finding good employees. It's got to become a business activity. Mm-hmm. And so there was a, there was a guy, so, and this hasn't changed a whole lot, but there was a guy, um, same as Azar. Um, I, I'm not even sure he's in the industry anymore, but he was up out of uh, Edmonton. And in the early uh, 15 years ago, Edmonton was just booming with oil and, and this was kind of unheard of. And now it's commonplace here. People at McDonald's were making 15 bucks an hour. Well, I guess if people at McDonald's are making 15 bucks an hour now. He couldn't find employees. It was really, really difficult. But one of the things he did is he would, he'd have a special made card that just had his company's name on it. And in the back of it, it had a place for him to write. And it said on the front of it, his company's name. And it said, we're looking for great people. And everywhere you saw somebody working hard, whether they were um, working at a, um, a retail store, or a, a restaurant, or he would hand out the card and say, hey, we're looking for great people just like you, if you'd like to make a career move. Um, so so the, that's the first thing. I think that um, you know, inherently we need to look at our businesses and we need to look at retention and we need to look at, um, at, at finding new people. And so it's gotta start with the culture. How, what, how, do we, what, how do we treat our employees? What does it feel like when we go here? Is it a drudgery to be there? And if it is, people are going to leave. Yeah. So if we can create a good workplace, it's going to attract new people. And then we just need to be creative in that process, whether it's, um, you know, someone might be headhunters, but really it's within your company, every employee can be a headhunter. Mm-hmm. Who do they know that knows somebody? How can they re- induce people to become, be part of, of your culture because they just love it. They become ambassadors, brand ambassadors for your company. And so um, it, it's just a process of always looking and um, I, I'm not going to chase after trying to be the highest paid, co- highest paying company because mm-hmm. it, it really upsets my apple cart when I now all of a sudden I bring in somebody for 
$32 an hour and they're working beside somebody who's already with my company is making 26. I got a problem. Yep. And so that's a tough game. Uh, I, I don't mind paying more based on incentive. You make money in, well, I'm sorry, I make money and the company wins. Now I can give you bonuses. And so tight into bonuses of compensation. But um, you know, I think there's a lot in that. But I think the first thing I'd look at, Michelle, is what is my company culture? Do people want to work there? And then once they're there, do they want to be fully engaged? And will they put in the effort to, to really excel? Or do they come in and they're looking for the next, uh, the next job and the next bonus and next, <laughs> the next raise somewhere? So I think those cards are such a fun idea. I saw one. Um... Restore right, King and Martin, they have them and they hand them out. And that I think that's a really good idea because there are some really good customer service people out there and you got to get them when you can. But right. okay, I want to talk about software a little bit. So there were a lot of changes in 2021, and I'm thinking there's going to be a lot more changes in 2022. You know, um, yeah. you know, next year being bought by CoreLogic was probably a big one, but there are some new software coming into the space. And, um, you know, Matterport and DocuSketch are already pretty popular, but, you know, other things coming in the space. So what did you see in 2021 in the software space? And what are you kind of predicting for 2022? Okay. I, I think so. So the first thing, and here's the bad news, there's going to be more software. There's going to be more programs. And one of my hopes, and one of the things I kind of been, it's, it's if I look a little further out and in, in kind of down the road, um, they're going to start interacting a little bit. There's, there's a bit there. I don't know a lot about this because I'm not a techie guy, but there's a, there, there's part of the software the language It's called API, which basically it's a translator that helps one software work with the other one. Software companies are just kind of inherently protective of their data and they don't want to open it up so other companies can get inside. It's sort of the equivalent of, of Apple and Microsoft. Mm -hmm. Our industry is all a bunch of apples. They want to protect their data and they don't want to open their platform. Um, some of them, you know, I looked at Encircle this year and one of the things they did is they became Microsoft. They said, hey, you know what? If you're relevant, we're opening up our platform and everybody can get in and out of it. We can go data back and forth. So that's the first thing is I really, I, I, I have some hope that the software starts talking. And so if we, if we enter data in one place, it's going to go into two or three other places and that'll be helpful. Uh, the, the, the reality is the software world solves problems and makes things easier. And it takes steps out. And artificial intelligence is going to be artificial intelligence and machine learning. And, you know, we're in an industry that it, we were entrepreneurs. We swung hammers and uh, we, we, we wiped down walls and we did things manually. And this, this process of, you know, bringing technology into it has been a slow, a slow move. Uh, now, now one of the things that's happening is the insurance world is going to start dragging us in. The insurance world was very slow to change. Mm -hmm. Now they're changing very, very rapidly. And so if we're not going to bring it forward, they're going to impose it on us. And I hope that we come, we come with the solutions to bring them to them. And they say, Hey, this is a really great solution to my problem, but <laughs> they're, they're like us. So state farm's not going to do the same technology that, um, Amica is that, uh, whatever they're all, they've all got their own platforms, which really stink. Not that they're bad. It's bad that they all want their own. And so, so, so that's been a problem. I, I do think that technology and I think software is going to, there's going to be more, not less, mm -hmm. that, but they're going to solve new problems or problems that have been really painful to us in the past. Yep. So that's good. And I think it's going to continue to, to be enhanced as well. What do you tell your clients? One of the big things that I was hearing around the time that Nextgear sold to CoreLogic, and it kind of had to do with CoreLogic and Veris, because these two big companies now mm -hmm. in the space, like, oh my gosh, they have so much of our data. Oh my gosh, now the carriers are going to know everything. I had so many contractors that were like, data, data, data. I'm so worried about this. So what have you been telling your laughing? So what have you been telling your clients who are concerned about their data being out there now? Well, so the first thing is, is uh, <laughs> insurance companies are really good at data. They've had the data. They've had a lot of our data. They know much more about our businesses than we do. So the first thing is, is we need to be good at our own data. We need to be good at, at mining the information in our company, knowing where our costs are, knowing where, where our risks are, knowing where um, our inefficiencies are, and, and being able to mine that. You know, it, it, partly we should be using it back to the insurance company. We should, and it's not a bad thing, but we should be able to grade our insurance companies. We should have data on them. So, you know, am I worried they have data on us? No, because they always had data on us. And so do, do I think there's nefarious things I can do with it? 
you know, at some point, uh, you, you can only squeeze so much out of out, out of a company, and then they're all yeah, we're necessary to them. So mm-hmm. I mentioned it before, and one of the things I think of is that we help fulfill the insurance promise, whether they like it or not. Rest- insurance companies need good restorers. They, they'd like to not have us, but they need us to solve their problems. And so th- they're not our partners. They don't care as much about us as we think they do. They care about them and they're going to sell us down the road really quickly. But at the same time, I'm not, wor- I'm, I'm I worried. I'm not worried, Michelle. I, I, I think that if we take care of our businesses and do it well, uh, and then in, with the hope that there's some really good stakeholders out there that, that are in some ways looking out for interest, but um, you'd be, you know, I think everybody would be surprised to know how much the insurance companies know about us. And with machine learning and with the artificial intelligence and, and everything else that's going on, uh, it's going to get more and more and more. We're all walking around naked is what's happening and we don't even realize it. Yeah, that's probably true. Do you see any other technology aside from software that some of your clients or restorers are starting to use this year that's kind of coming into the space that might change things up a little bit? Um, not, not particularly. I mean, I think that the, the integration of software and hardware. Yeah. So if you took a little Thermostore, or yeah, I think it was uh, what Thermostore is doing with their, um, no, it's Legends, Legends brands where their air movers are speaking to, or the dehumidifiers are speaking to the, the software that's telling us how much equipment we have and what the, the, the temperature humidity. Uh, so, yeah, and I, I just think they're going to start working better together. But I think that, you know, on a macro level, that's where you're going to see big hardware type stuff that's going to change. I and mean, I, I just can imagine that you're going to here. Here's my view down the road. This is 2029 restoration. You ready? Ready. Um, the employees are going to hop into their self-driving car. And believe it or not, if you, so I read this book. It, it surprised me. I really liked it because I, I like looking at trends and, and knowing what's going on in the world, the future is faster than you think. Um, here in my bookshelf somewhere, here it is. The future is faster than you think. Okay. Highly recommended, very, very fascinating. Um, so here's the world according to them, and they're gonna tell you why you won't believe it's gonna happen, but it's happening right now and you don't even know it's happening, okay? So you're gonna, your employees are probably gonna hop into an autonomous driving vehicle that's gonna take them to a job site, and then they're gonna, that the vehicle is going to go to the next job site or the next opportunity or wherever it yeah. is. And then your materials are going to show up on a flying drone, which are going to be dropped at the job site, or they'll be there already one or the other. And then you're going to, so we're going to find more efficiencies on the job site. We're going to find less. So if I've got a vehicle taking me, I don't need to stop for coffee. I don't need to stop at home Depot and go shopping for about 30 minutes before I pick up the, uh, the piece of trim that I need before I go to the job site, before I stand there and talk to the guy at the front counter. So efficiencies through technology are going to come from a macro big picture level. I just think that some, it's really, it's scary when you look at what's going to be happening and it's really brilliant. And so I think that, uh, you know, things, self-monitoring has always been an issue or it's always, Hey, a promise of you're not going to have to go to the job site, but I think that that stuff's going to get better and better, and it's going to be more and more refined. And then the technology is going to start communicating back to the office or directly to the insurance company or through our billing systems, and so it'll start making more of a straight line between work and invoice or cash. And then hopefully we get actually straight line payments back to us right away. But hard to say how that works. I I I, I just see there's a lot in that world, and it's going to some of it's going to take longer than is predicted. And a lot of it's going to take, it's going to really surprise a lot of people. So uh, that's the, the, when you start looking really long-term and, and I don't know that I want to do a lot of writing about what's going to happen in eight or nine or 10 years, because <laughs> it, it's unfathomable, I think, mm-hmm. but at the same time, there's, you got to put new systems and new technology into a world where there's existing old systems and technology and how those guys, how that integrates and blends together is, probably some of the biggest challenges. So for you know, but take electric vehicles right now. Great electric vehicles kind of make sense, but there's no infrastructure for yeah. a full transition. That's why we're that's why we're stuck with gas still. And even though it's cost us four or five it's like California, so it was six dollars a gallon at one of the stations we drove by. It was just unbelievable. And uh, so great, let's go to, let's go electric. Well wait a minute. We can't go all electric with our fleet and everything else because I can't charge them. Yeah, effectively, efficiently. I can't drive as far as I want to go, and and then th- there's we. 
how am I going to change over my entire fleet? So you got to do new and old technology blending together. It kind of slows things down and kind of having that, that uh, process of um, kind of transition will be, uh, that, that's what is really, really difficult to kind of predict. All right. So I want to move on to the topic of M&A. This has been a huge topic that's continued on for a few years. So it started before 2021, but it was a big prediction in 2021. You scored well on that one. And now it's a prediction for 2022. Um, so where do you see m a going? Is this going to be a trend that continues for a while? Okay. So, so the first thing I want to do is we want to look at what are the drivers of mergers and acquisitions. And the first one is you have to look and say, why are companies looking at restoration? Restoration is a massively fragmented marketplace. There's a lot of independent players. And then we look at part of that's motivation and insurance. And I'm going to, I'm going to simplify these numbers and I'm going to simplify this discussion of valuation uh, kind of massively. And I'm going to make the numbers probably not real because I don't want to misinterpret anything. I just want to get the, the thought is that there, there's this arbitrage that says, I'm going to go and I'm going to buy a restoration company and I'm going to take their earnings and I'm going to do a multiple on their earnings. So if they uh, if they made a uh, whatever, whatever their earnings dollar is, I'm going to pay them three times that when I buy them. And then I'm going to buy five of these companies. I'm going to repackage them up and I'm going to sell them for five, six, seven times that. It's, that's the arbitrage is I get a return on my investment with very little risk. So that was kind of the, the start of this process. And then we've got people that are, they're, so they're looking at that. The equity money is looking at that. They're, they we're in a world where there's not a lot of yield. You can't go into a, a treasury bond or a money market fund and get any money. There's a lot of risk all around us. We've got an industry that is risk averse. And then there's a lot of, so it's risk averse because there's always going to be fires. There's always going to be floods. It's a growing industry because we're having more natural disasters and it's kind of, it's kind of in the news. And so now you, you have one equity company sniffing around and starting to buy. And now you get another one, you get another one. And so the equity wave, there's a lot of big players making a lot of acquisitions. I get calls on probably a monthly basis from a new equity player that's saying, tell me about the industry. And so um, th- there's, th- there's just a lot of interest in it. And so it's, it's that arbitrage. It's an industry that has got a reasonable return. Mm-hmm. It's not what some of us are used to. We have to work a little harder to make the same amount of money that we used to, all that other stuff that goes into it. But there's a reasonable return in it. You got a fragmented market. You've got um, the, this opportunity for arbitrage. You've got just kind of all that awareness. So um, one of the things that happened last year was really, um, <laughs> it, it, was a, it was a really, really frothy market called frothy. The prices oh. were going through the roof. Um, it was, there was lots of acquisitions happening. Mm-hmm. And then in kind of in the middle of this, there was this talk of a massive change in the capital gains rate. That's how a company that sells, that's how, that, that's how they're taxed is capital gains. Yeah. Okay. There was discussions at the congressional level that the capital gains, which were the federal is around, it's somewhere in the mid twenties, low twenties, like 22, 23, something like that. There was discussions that they, they wanted to move it to 42%. They were practically in a double capital gains. And that was a serious discussion that was going on in the wow. late spring into the summer. And then it was when you, you kind of got some disruptions in the uh, kind of the, 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 let's say the controlling party, because they had all, you know, so once they weren't all aligned, now all of a sudden that started falling apart. But when people looked to sell, they were looking when that discussion was going on saying, holy smokes, well, I give up half of my sale price and capital gains taxes if I sell next year or the year after, maybe I should do it this year. So at the end of the year, there was a lot of activity going on. Yep. Um, it's not slowing down this year and the taxes really aren't changing much. Uh, taxes will change. They have to, the government's spending way too much money and you can't do that in perpetuity or maybe they think they can. I don't know. Um, a whole nother discussion. It is a whole nother discussion. So we don't really want to get into that, but capital gains rates will likely change. And as that changes, then it changes maybe people's desires to sell. Um, it, it's, uh, offering a nice uh, exit spot for a lot of people. And it's kind of fun to be a part of it. And companies are looking and saying, okay, maybe I can get two sales. We can sell the first time and I can retain some equity and then I can sell again. So there's a lot of things that people are kind of, they're, they're excited and interested in. And, you know, it's, it's nice. It's, it's nice to be desired or wanted. And so a lot of, you know, it, you get these calls day in and day out. I mean, if you were to take every one of them, you'd, sing, you'd probably get a call every single day. And so 
first thing is the price is the price is pretty high right now. The price will come down to some reasonable level, uh, but the the M and A is not going to it's not going to change. It's, it's it's just an evolution of an industry, and it's happening in the insurance world, the broker world, the property management world. It, it's it's the business cycle, and so no, I don't think it's going to slow down. I think the prices will the the multiples will change. They're pretty high right now. They'll come down a bit, um, but yeah. It, so I, I'm I'm going to anticipate a question for you. What should what should a company do if they're sitting there and they're getting all these calls? Um, my 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 advice will go on the record and say I probably would not start returning those calls. I would I would figure it, it's not that I want to sell, but you need to be prepared to sell. So what, the, you know, what this, these, what these companies are doing, they're saying, Hey, you know, okay, just sign an NDA. I want to get, uh, I want to have a conversation with you. Send me your numbers. I'm going to give you a price. Well, I would probably spend a little more time, be more strategic about it. I'd figure out who the people that I have an alignment with, who do I, who, who's a good fit for me. And then I would talk to a professional, whether it's a broker or your attorney or whoever and say, what number should I give them? Because, you know, once they have your numbers, what is that? What's it going to do for you? You can get a price, but you know, Michelle, I can go. I can go right now, and I can go on Zillow, and Zillow is going to tell me what my home is worth. Yeah. But it's not worth anything until I actually put a sign out in front and somebody pays me for it. And so, I don't know that there's a whole lot of advantage to companies doing that. I, I do think it's you know, if you want to sell, good. Have a strategic discussion, and then 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 before you do that, then figure out where your fit is and where your alignment is. You don't want to have just one buyer. You want to talk to four or five. You want to figure out where your fit and your alignment is. And then you want to know what kind of numbers you should give them. Not the numbers that you think that, you know, that you're going to put yourself in a position of weakness. So that's my thought. Get some professional advice one way or the other. Broker, professional, your, your professional team, whatever that is. So what do you tell companies that are like, well, I don't want to sell. I'm not ready to sell yet, but I see all of these bigger players coming into my market and my market's consolidating and here I am. How do I stay competitive? Ooh, I love it. Um, you know what? I, I don't think that that is. So first of all, I think competition makes you better. Uh-huh. You can't, you can't operate the way you always did if your competitors are better, but if it's just a big, if it's a, if it, let's call it the biggest restoration company in the world, if it's ABC restoration company and they come into your market, it's still a local market. It's still local relationships. Yep. They're going to have, you know, these big companies will have the ability to get decisions made in a boardroom in New York City or Houston, Texas or wherever. And you're not in that market. And you're not in that discussion. So you will miss out on that. But the other part of it is you need to look and say, OK, how do I create a company that withstands that? How do I become the best operator in my marketplace? How do I how do I focus on the margins, make sure that I'm profitable? How do I create a great place to work so my employees want to stay with me and I'm going to attract great companies? So you're not going to outbig the bigs, okay. but you can, you, can, you can become better than them or you can just become better than you were the day before. And so you're going to protect your profits. You're going to make sure that one of the things that, that I'm aware of is that, that I might have, if I have 80% of my company, 80% of my work coming from one client, and that one client is either acquired or they have a preferred vendor program with this mega restoration, ABC restoration company that shows in my marketplace, I might lose 80% of my work. That's really risky. So if, if we have less than 20% and my, you know, that's, that's kind of my first barometer, but I think that if you have less than 10% or 5% coming from any one work source, you're in a good spot. You've got a degree, you got a safety net around you. You lose one company, you lose five or 10% of your work doesn't destroy your company, maybe impacts your profits. But so make sure that you create a type of company that people want to work for that is serving your community and serving your clients exceptionally well, really focus on becoming a great operator, operate with integrity. Mm -hmm. So it's just basic business. And so whether you, maybe you don't want to sell your company or maybe you want to sell, it's the same process. If you create a saleable company, it becomes easier to operate. So then you have a choice. And if you sell, guess what? We talked about that. They're going to give you a multiple of earnings. If mm-hmm. it's three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, whatever it is, if you don't sell, you get 100% of those earnings up until the point at which you sell. There so you maybe you want to retain the profits and then sell later. There's always going to be a buyer. You get 100% of the profits and then you get to sell three, four, five years later. Or you get the money up front and you work for somebody else and you, you get a paycheck and you know, whatever, but that's not good or bad. I just think that the process of creating a saleable company 
makes it much more manageable. And a lot of people do that. And they say, gosh, why would I want to sell now? I really like what I'm doing. My job is great. So, it's there, a, you know, it's there's, there's risk in there. And then, you know, the, the always on restoration world, it's just tiring. It's hard. It, it's a hard business. And, you know, you, you get four or five clients on every, on, on some of the more complex jobs and the, you, you got people fighting with you about money and you got employee problems. And, you know, so at some point you, you wave the white flag and say, you know what, I want somebody else to take over some of these problems and I'm going to have less stress in my life. So. Sure. How much have you seen inflation affecting your clients so far and how have they been kind of adjusting for that when maybe I know when maybe Xactimate prices aren't accurate? So, so there's a couple of levels on that. And in, so I think it, the, uh, you know, you heard that inflation is transitory. We don't have to worry about it. I, inflation is not transitory. And now that uh, I just heard something on the radio today, they're saying that oil could go up to $175 a barrel. That's quite remarkable. And it doesn't mean that it's just my gas. It means that gas basically is a cost component to everything we get, everything we do. And so I don't think inflation is transitory. And actually in my article, because it was, I was thinking that maybe we start tapering off by the end of the year. It's not going to, I really don't, you know, it, well, it might taper off. It's not going away. We're, we're stuck with inflation for quite a while. Um, the, so one of the things people really hate Xactimate for whatever, you know, for a lot of reasons. I don't hate Xactimate. I, I, I'm kind of neutral on it. The one thing that I like is that last year, the prices were going up so fast in so many different markets and so many different products. Uh, and Xactimate did a really reasonable job of adjusting to those prices. So, so the first thing is, is make sure you do your pricing feedback, make sure you understand the software you have, make sure that, um, that you know your costs, and then you know how to break Xactimate apart and look at what are they projecting for the material parts. People use Xactimate every single day and they don't know how it works. It blows me away. That's, that's the main revenue driver. So, so here's one thing that I don't get. So uh, CoreLogic, Symbility is now a big player. Mm -hmm. People know how Xactimate prices are created and where they come from and how to update and potentially influence them. Most people, even the sophisticated clients that I'm working with, they don't understand that about Symbility. I'd say it'd be in their best interest to try to figure that out. So, so that's the first thing. Materials, materials are a little easier to handle mm -hmm. and understand. The, the, so, so I'm going to take a couple, couple steps. In. The first one is know what the what, what the the cost within your pricing database is. Like, what are they projecting your cost is, and is that right or wrong? And if it's not, you can easily go back to most insurance companies and say, "Hey, the price of OSB." is 30% higher than what was coming in this. And here's the proof for it. Well, it tends to, an adjuster will say, okay, I get it. So have the backup and the proof. Yep. The other thing is do your pricing feedback. So your price is reflected in that. I don't know what's happening with labor right now in labor. So I'm not sure how easily that's, how that's adapting. And it's, it's really crazy what's happening. If I, you know, technicians, if, if I'm a technician, I can go into a no risk job, probably not a lot of value to me, but a no risk job. I can go into a fast food, into a retail, into something that's really easy. And I can make a lot, I can make $15, $16 an hour in a lot of markets. And, and a lot of people, if I'm driving down the road, I see signing bonuses. Chipotle is paying for college education. Not all of it, they're doing reimbursements in, tar in Target and all these other companies. Target, I just saw an article the other day, they were raising their prices, their, their retail wages a lot. So $24 surprised. an hour for some people. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> so here we're trying to hire a technician for, let's say we're thinking we're being really generous. We're going to pay him $16 an hour, the starting wage. About, that was, you know, four years ago, some people in some markets were starting wages at uh, 9, 10, 11, 12. Mm -hmm. Now mm -hmm. we're thinking we're doing it at 16. I'm competing against a retail store. They get to walk in and they get to kind of wander around the store and they get to smile and uh, greet people. My job, you're on call 24, 365. I'm going to send you under a house to pull out wet insulation in the mud <laughs> at two o'clock in the morning. Or maybe we're doing bio cleanup. I'm going to talk about the details of that. And we're going to, are we going to pay them the same? We're competing with that. They maybe could create a career as a technician. So we just talk about career development and upper mobility and why would they want to do it? But we also need to take a look at who, it's not just what's what. We're, so now we're competing with what we're paying because 
we've got a whole established group of employees getting paid a certain amount and we're going to try to find new employees. And we were thinking $16 an hour is great because everybody else working for us is getting 16, 17, 18. And we got to pay them 22. And they're going to come and stand inside beside somebody in an office that's making 16 and we're paying 22 to the new person who knows nothing. Mm -hmm. It's so, so understanding the cost of your labor is going to be a real problem. And that's just one level. So exactly in your pricing database may reflect that. And we might be able to be able to push up those prices by doing feedback or understanding our costs by doing a retail price, by using our own price list. If we're on a vendor program, it's hard to do that. If we're doing retail work, meaning um, Joe Smith has a water damage in their house and they call us because of the internet, we could charge a little more probably. We got our own retail price list. And then we can do pricing feedback, maybe impact our exact rate prices. Great. What it doesn't impact is my overhead costs. What about the people I'm not billing for? What about my marketing people, my estimators, my project managers, my administrative team? They're not an exact. I mean, my, my unit costs aren't being impacted. My overhead's being impacted. That's a problem. So now you have to have a business solution saying, okay, am I going to grow? Am I going to cut back? Am I going to, you know, where do the wages fit in there? How do I create more efficiencies? How do, you know, one of the things might have to be more serious about performance. If you're not performing, I might ask you to move on. It might free up your future. They say, well, uh, <laughs> you can go work at Target for $24 an hour. I, I, I don't, you know, it, each of those is a strategic decision. It's a business decision. And there are things that are outside of our control in our business that are impacting our business quite substantially. And we need to be aware of that. And we need to figure out how we're going to handle and address that. And it's not just, I, I, I'm going to wake up someday and think, okay, yeah, well, you know, well, let's just move our prices. That's, you know, one, one, of, the, one of my analogies is that um, in, the, in the work I do, I, I look at this company as, uh, as like this ball of string and I see a, a loose string on the end of it. And I'm thinking, I'm just going to pull on this. I'm going to pull on this and unwind it. Well, the problem is I pull on that string because that was the thing I thought I needed to do and it created a knot on the other side. And now I really have a mess. And so the company is, you know, it, if you're going to focus on one thing, the problem may be on the other side of it. And I think that's part of the challenge. And as we get into these issues in our companies and we're really close to these problems, we're not aware that the, the solution is something else or the real problem. We're only looking at a symptom of a real problem. The real problem is something else and we're solving a symptom. Solving a symptom. Yep. <clears throat> yep. That's a good way of putting it. Okay. So one of your predictions for 2021 had to do with AGA progress. So this, my next question kind of has a little bit to do with that and position papers and TPAs and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. The conversation has been going on for years now of like, how do we bridge the gap between carriers and TPAs and contractors and kind of smooth that relationship over and everybody's working for the customer and all of that. Where do you see that conversation going? Where does it need to go? Okay. So, so we'll go back to, I'm, I'm going to go back a little bit that uh, maybe everyone who's here wasn't, wasn't aware of. Um, okay. Mark Springer wrote a, Mark Springer is the president of RIA, mm -hmm. and he wrote an article. He, he, I think he woke up one night in cold sweats trying to figure out, oh my God, what's going to happen to my business? And he had this belief that if we did not do anything to take control of our business in 10 years, we will not recognize our industry at all. That it was that there was here we're a bunch of we're just being blown around by the wind and we weren't in control of what's happening, and yeah. so he wrote a brilliant part which went in Cleaning and Restoration Magazine, a four part article on here's the problems that we see and what was so smart about it is he laid out the whole direction of how we treat these problems from margin to uh, being abused by uh, for payment by um, by consultants to you know all of these things that were, that were impacting us and our company. I don't know if he addressed each one of those, but the AGA does. He just said, we have problems and we have to talk about it. And we have to be serious about it. And that was so smart, not only because he identified the problems, but in there, he laid out the solution so wisely. And so, so in doing that, he laid out kind of the foundation for what the AGA should be. And the, the, they're starting to get, so one of the things I noticed last year is in, in the spring, because everybody was sitting around um, in, in COVID quarantine or, or working virtually, and maybe it's just because it was my involvement. I was involved with the AGA and some fundraising stuff, and I saw lots of updates. Towards the end of last year, everybody's busy. There's all this m &A stuff going on. There's a, and so it seemed like it lost a little bit of traction. Mm -hmm. We're coming to the coming to the convention again, which is good. It's yeah. good. It's very timely. 
So the AGA basically is, well, let's, so for those, if anybody's listening and they're not fully aware, it's, it's in essence a, um, uh, a lobbying group to, to try to make things better in our businesses from pricing to uh, payment to, to um, just whatever uh, regulation. So, mm-hmm. so there's, there's five, four or five different real focuses within the AGA. Um, one of the great things that happened was that um, we, we have an advocate. So Ed Cross is brilliant in that. And so it, he's, he understands the industry. He understands the insurance world and he understands the legal world. And so all of that makes him a really good advocate for the industry and pushing direction. The other thing that was really cool is there's some really, really solid people working on committees to help drive and make change. So I think that it, so first of all, I think that it created a lot of great things that helped move pricing. It helped, um, helped our relationship with the consultants. Uh, thank you, Jay, as held for showing up and having discussions with us. You know, um, John D'Amico for having discussions and talking about what's going on in their world and how that interacts with us. And so we have a dialogue. So it's not just throwing stones over a wall. It's having a conversation. So that was good. I just seemed like it started slowing down a little bit, not from the people who are directly working in it, but from an awareness in the industry. Maybe it was just my lack of awareness. Maybe I wasn't paying much attention, but I kind of thought that some of the momentum was lost there. And it probably was lost from a fundraising standpoint. This is a volunteer effort. This is not RIA's main focus. This is a offshoot of the RIA that's saying, hey, this is a, vol- please donate some money, get involved and help participate to make the industry better. And so what, you know, the, the, it helps with um, our representation on large losses. It helps with getting payments on undisputed amounts. It helps improve the pricing and exact, exact it has been really good through this process. They've been a good partner in helping with prices when before I think they kind of ignored restoration. Uh, intentionally, unintentionally, I don't have any opinion on how that happened, but I think the EGA helped drive that quite substantially and it helped unify voices and that was really good. And so because the partners across, the partners, the people we work with across the aisle, be, you know, I, I can't call them partners because their, their, their motivations are very different than ours, but whether it's the consultants or the insurance companies or the pricing database programs, everything else, it helps create a bit of an alignment and it gives us a collective voice because we are so fragmented. We need to have, we need to have a collective voice that, that is shouting together Mm-hmm. The, part of the problem is I, do, I still don't think we're there. Uh, you know, the, 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 we're just not, we're not collective. We're still a pretty disparate group of people as we get more and more big players in there. And, and I, and I've got some advanced notice of what's going on with the board at, at the, the board um, the nominations and the discussion of what's coming up and who's going to be brought into the board. There's some quite substantial players that maybe will help move the needle a bit and try to get, Mark, Mark Springer told me one day, he says, you know, the problem we got with RIA, he says, we're, we're the industry association and we have less than a thousand members. So how many players are there in the industry? If there's 20,000 people and we have a thousand members. Are we the voice of the industry? And so the AGA is an offshoot of RIA. So we got to get a bigger uh, umbrella for RIA. And then we need to, to tell people why they need to help support something else in addition to that but it's self-funding. It's self-funding. That's the cool thing. It, it is cool. And they ask for so little, really like one, one hundredth of 1% of your right of your yeah. annual revenue. And so, right. Isn't, I think that that's what it is. So yeah. And, and if it's a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars, it's, you know, just uh, help participate because it's good for the industry. And, you know, it's, it's kind of like union dues, you know, to whatever you think of that, but um, it's kind of, you have, you have a collective voice. And so what do I think? So my prediction is, yeah, I think the AGA was necessary. I think it's appropriate. I think that it, I suspect that when we go to Reno here shortly, mm-hmm. there's going to be a lot of discussion and yep. there's going to be next steps in there. I think that we really need to get to advocacy at a local level mm-hmm. and that's more volunteer stuff and that's more money and, but, you know, I had one client that actually hired a lobbyist. He was in Florida. He was getting just so much pressure from insurance companies. And he said, you know what? And he, and he, how, do you, how do you compete with insurance companies that are paying millions of dollars in lobbying to a small contractor paying 50000 for a lobbyist to kind of 
push push for for a voice so if you can collectively put that together we're not going to have the same amount of money but we at least get a voice Mm -hmm. and i think that's important yes okay anything else you want to add we talked about a lot (laughs) we did talk a lot it's it's fine (laughs) i i I enjoyed this um so a couple i mean if we look at it the, the, the important thing about trends i think it's important to understand trends i think it's important to see around the corner Mm-hmm. because you want your business to be relevant, not just today, but you want to be relevant in three, four, five years. And in order to be relevant in three, four, five years, you have to look beyond to today. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of pressures on us. There's a lot of pressures on the insurance companies. And, you know, there, there's, um, you, you had mentioned before, you know, what, what's my thought about uh, all these insurance companies having more data and what about the one thing I'm going to look at and say, I want to be, I want to try to control the things I can control. You know, is that the serenity prayer? Know, know what I can control and then really focus on that. When I start worrying about things that I have zero control over, then it's just going to make me crazy. And it's going to cause lots of stress in my life. And so if I can create a great workplace, if I can create a great environment, if I can take care of my employees, if I can define really what I stand for, what's my mission? And am I living in my mission? And am I driving towards my vision, which takes some clarity on looking forward? And then I do things today that that fulfill my mission and drive my vision. I'm gonna have I'm gonna have this great company that people are start be, wanting to be a part of. And you know, there's there's a lot of things where we just the, the employees have lots of assumptions about the owners are doing, and we end up with with fighting in our companies, and we end up fighting in our industries and in our marketplaces, and you know. I think that if we if we start looking at making things better, and if we if we, as the competitor competition increases in our marketplace, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think that one of my one of my colleagues, Ken Tucker, used to say he says I could compete with competence. I cannot compete with incompetence because it's so unpredictable. <laughs> And so if we raise the competence of our marketplace, of the people there, and we become a good a, a good performer, yep. then I think that that helps. You know, I, I, I um, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of outside discussion. I, I just read an article in New Yorker magazine. Have you ever read that one um, about temporary labor during catastrophes? It was about labor during catastrophes, and <laughs> there's some people that are not very good arbiters and representatives of our industry. Yeah, that are really abusing people doing work for us. You know, those kind of things I think need to go away, and we need to become a serious industry. We need to take care of the people we're working around us. We have to create valuable businesses that we can personally be proud of and that we can represent our community and we can represent our industry well. And so regardless of what's happening out there in trends, be aware of the trends, manage your business, protect your margins, watch your cash flow, know your cash, because a lot of people don't think about, they think about profits maybe, but they don't think about cash. Yep. And that we, we can't operate the business without that. So so given that, I, you know, there's there's a lot to that. I think that maybe is a good wrap up. Um, I enjoy the discussion of the trends. I, I rate myself. I welcome everybody and anybody to go in and look at my my predictions and rate me. I don't. I, I've got thick skin. I actually kind of like it, and it maybe it leads to a dialogue or maybe better understanding on my part or something else. So, um, and the reason I rate myself is not to take credit for it. It's to give myself um, credibility. Because you can make wacko, crazy predictions, but uh, if you're always wrong, then then why, what's the point? Or why should anybody read it? So, and you're the other part about it is, <laughs> yeah, I do like. I I think it's appropriate to give recommendations because if that's a trend, what does that mean to you? So that being said, those are my kind of my my thoughts there for for whatever it's worth. They're worth a lot. Well, Phil, thank you so much for your time. I always enjoy talking to you and this is a great conversation. And thank you for letting me publish articles in CNR. I loved the cover and it was part of the rebrand issue and everything. So that's been really fun. So I appreciate that. I look forward to seeing you at RIA, keeping the conversation going. And um, thank you so much for your time. You're very welcome. It was a pleasure. For more restoration today, visit our website, cnrmagazine.com or find us wherever you get your favorite podcasts.